every single musical scale has its own flavor, its own unique identity, and its own emotion that it comes with it. Lydian, most people would agree, has this kind of spacey, sci-fi, out there vibe. And in my opinion, Lydian Dominant has all that great stuff, but it's less bright, it's less happy, and it's less floaty. It has a lot more bite to it. It's got a little bit of a zany, harebrained, chaotic feel to it, which I really, really enjoy. It is a weird-sounding scale to use in the rock and roll genre. We usually hear Lydian Dominant being talked about by jazz players, but I think it's a completely legitimate scale to use. I've heard it a lot in some really cool progressive metal, uh, the band Intervals. I know specifically they write with it uh, quite frequently. So I want to show you a little bit about the Lydian Dominant scale, what we could do to compose with it, and more importantly, using a scale like this to compose some really complicated rhythmic patterns and, you know, a kind of cool, proggy, genty groove like you heard in the intro right there. So let's get down to it. The first thing we really need to know is what is Lydian Dominant, how do we build it, all that stuff. So, a Lydian dominant scale is the same thing as a Lydian scale, but we've just flatted the seventh note. If you don't know what Lydian is, that's fine. You should probably learn it, but here's how we would build it from scratch. Today, I'm going to start on the note A. If I want to build a Lydian dominant scale, I'll start on A, and then I'll go travel a whole step, another whole step, another whole step, and then a half step, a whole step, another half step, and then another whole step. And that will give me these notes A, B, C sharp, D sharp, E, F sharp, G, and A. And those would be the notes of A Lydian dominant, or you could call it A Lydian flat seven. You can also think of these notes as being the fourth mode of the melodic minor scale. So if you know what a melodic minor scale is, well, if you just start that from the fourth note, then you'll end up with the same sequence of half steps and whole steps. So even right now, we can start hearing a little bit about how the scale feels and the emotion that it conveys. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to hang out on the tonic note. Okay, that's A. I'm just going to hang out here. And then I'm going to go up and down the scale. Right? And I could call that a riff. It's kind of a, I mean, it's a pretty linear riff just going up, but you hear it's not happy like major, it's not sad like minor, it's not really dark and crushing like you know, a Phrygian dominant or something like that. It's got this weird kind of quirkiness to it, which I really, really enjoy. And that's just going up and down. What if I mixed it up? It, Right? So that's where I started coming up with the riff that you heard at the beginning, is essentially just playing the notes of the scale and surrounding it a lot with my tonic, which is A. In fact, what I like to do is I like to surround it with the tonic power chord, okay? Imagine if I took every single one of these notes and I turned them all into power chords. A, D, C sharp, D sharp, E, F sharp, and G, right? Well, now I can make a riff just by using those power chords. And then including the notes of the scale. Back to the notes of the scale back to the power chords, right? So a little bit of combination of both there. Now, something to keep in mind, when you do power chords, sometimes you'll end up adding a note that is not in the scale. For example, if I play a G power chord, uh, you'll see that my ring finger is playing a D. And there is no D in my uh, Lydian dominant scale in the key of A. So this is like an illegal power chord. I'm not allowed to play a G power chord. But screw that, I mean, it sounds good. I'm getting the tonality of the flat at seventh by going from that power chord to my A. The fact that this note's not in the key doesn't bother me. It doesn't sound bad. And just the fact that it's not in the key doesn't mean, oh, don't do it. If you like the way it sounds, you should do it. You know, all this music theory stuff isn't to tell you what you can't do. It's to give you ideas of what has been done before and how can you replicate that. And then you're really free to kind of do whatever you want with it. So in this video, really what I wanted to get into is not writing so much note riffs, but more rhythmic riffs. This is the kind of stuff I really like like with Gent and Prague, when you've got these rhythmic pulses that are kind of tricky to follow and they're really ripe for polybeater and strange time signatures that flow on top of it. So here's what I did, okay? I took this idea of seven plus seven plus seven plus nine. All right, it's a simple concept. Anytime you're working with odd numbers, you're probably gonna get something that sounds, you know, progressive and cool. So when you're working with odd time signatures, one thing you shouldn't do is just blast away at every one of those notes. For example, it's kind of boring if I just do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 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 eight, nine. Putting gaps in between those rhythmic phrases is way more interesting. For example, a grouping of seven would sound a little bit more progressive if instead of playing seven eighth notes, I played a dotted quarter note and then two quarter notes. That would give me this pulsing of one, two, three, one, two, one, two, 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 one, two, three. 
So anytime you're dealing with an odd time signature, try to subdivide it into smaller groupings and then just play the beginning of those groupings and you'll get these kind of pulsy, weird time... Well, I threw my pick. I found it. Okay, so by playing those little accents, you get that pulsing pattern that you've probably heard a lot in prog rock. And you're free to change that. Right now, I'm just doing this consistent pattern of one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, three. But, you know, what if you did... Uh, one, two, one, two, one, two, three. One, two, one, two, one, two, three. Or what if you did one, two, three, four, five. One, two, one, two, three, four, five. One, two, one, two, three, four, five. All different valid options to give you a progressive feel over a simple grouping like seven. So my grouping is consistent. It goes one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, three. And I do that three times because I've got three groupings of seven. On my last grouping of nine, what I do is a grouping of three. And then I do a grouping of four. And then I do a grouping of two. So that last one is one, two, three. One, two, three, four, one, two. Putting it all together, here's what it sounds like. One, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, 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 three, four, one, two. So what I'm doing there is hanging out on an A power chord and just doing the pulses as prescribed. From there, eventually I move up to that B power chord because the two chord is an important chord in Lydian dominant. It's a very important chord in the Lydian scale naturally. And since I'm surrounded by all these weird diminished and augmented chords, I want something that sounds nice and easy. That two chord is a really good bet in the Lydian key or the Lydian dominant key. And I do have the synthesizers kind of uh, backing up that chord. So I have the synthesizers outlining an A major chord. And then I have the synthesizers outlining uh, an A major with a sharp 11 or a tritone added in there. And then also uh, back to just a regular A major. And of course, going to that B chord once again. So I am on a six string and I want to make the sound genty. And uh, A is way up here on the fifth fret. But... What if I invert my A power chord? For example, an A power chord is just an A and an E. So I could play an A here and an E here, and I'd have the notes of an A power chord. They're just, they're just reversed, right? And these are like inverted power chords. Metallica's done this thing a lot. Uh, you see this kind of thing in Smoke on the Water. Smoke on the Water is all those uh, inverted power chords like that, where the root is actually on the thinner string. So instead of playing my A power chord here, how about I just play my A power chord completely open on my sixth string, which is hilarious to just plug away at those zeros like that and not be in drop D, right? So just hanging out there, this would be implying a B because I have my B here and my F sharp right there. Now, this might not sound like an A or a uh, B, but if I add in a bass guitar underneath that, that's going to give these inverted power chords more context. So really what I'm doing is uh, about as gent as it gets on a six string to just plug away at two open strings at the same time and still have it somehow sound melodic, right? Now, writing a solo for this would be a lot of fun, but it would also be a different video. So I will do something like that in the future. Um, I wanted to make this video to kind of show you a little bit of the thought process that goes through my head when I decide to write in an exotic scale like Lydian Dominant. It's not really the scale you sit down and, and write riffs with, but hey, if you give it a try, you might end up with something really surprising. And I really like the way this riff feels. This is actually going to be the verse section in a song I wrote. Uh, I have been working for way too long on a concept album. I'm embarrassed to tell you how long I've been working on this concept album, but it's an over-the-top prog rock album, and this song that you're hearing, this riff, is going to be in a song for when our main character travels to the future, right? What better scale to pick for a song about traveling to the future than Lydian Dominant? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a little sneak peek of what the vocals would do on top of this riff, because writing anything on top of odd time signatures can be tricky, but if you really go back to those subdivisions and you look at those, those accent patterns, then those can kind of be the scaffolding on which any melody that you write hangs on or any guitar solo you write can hang on those accented patterns. So take a listen to this entire section again, but now with some vocals sang by yours truly.
So thanks for watching this video. If you did enjoy this video, please consider supporting my channel on Patreon. I have a link down in the description. If you can't do that, that's fine. Just like, subscribe, favorite, all that kind of stuff. And I will plan on seeing you in the not so distant future. Thanks.